Hi, everybody. I am so pleased to be sponsoring and hosting this uh, conversation between three very interesting and talented artists. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for participating. And for those of you who are at home watching, I hope you enjoy what is about to commence. Um, we want to thank Made in LA for including us in the festival this year. And we hope that you will all tune in to many of our different aspects of programming. I wanted to introduce SOS Siren before we begin. Um, it was a response to COVID-19 and the physical isolation of COVID-19. Snijana and I started a collaboration and video dialogue. SOS Siren was born out of that pro project. Our intention is to give voice to the silence and the silenced. SOS stands for Snijana and Sharon, while also referencing the Morse code distress signal. Siren also has a double meaning. It is both an alarm and references the winged women of Greek mythology. For the 20 days of Made in LA, we have created a variety of programs which include these dialogues, studio visits, two community generated videos, all of which can be found on our website. We are honored to have our first guest today with the hope to have many more dialogues that will look deeply into art practice and address the difficult questions that are not talked about in mainstream media. If you have any questions, please post them and we will get to them in the last 30 minutes of our conversation. And so now I would like to introduce you to Dan Kwong. He is an award-winning multimedia performance artist, playwright, director, and visual artist who is presenting his, has been presenting his work nationally and internationally since 1989. Hailed by critics as a master storyteller, Kwong combines his own life experiences with the historical and the contemporary to explore the many facets of societal identity. Recently, his work has focused on the profound influence of family in shaping attitudes, relationships, and behavior. As the Associate Artistic Director of Great Leap, he is also involved in using the performing arts as a tool for community building through workshops and public participatory events. Thank you, Dan, for being here. And if you would just begin by sharing some of your work with us. Yeah, I have a little uh, video sampler with uh, some uh, brief excerpts from uh, four different pieces. So um, I'll just explain a little bit before we roll it. The first one is um, a, a, a golden oldie uh, from a piece called uh, Monkhood and Three Easy Lessons. This is from back in the 90s. Um, and um, this particular, so I'm a storyteller. I uh, work with autobiographical material. Uh, and so this is a story about my Chinese grandfather. And this is taken from the very end of the show. Uh, and, uh, you know, my Chinese grandfather was sort of looked upon as the, the uh, family embarrassment. Uh, he, was, he was kind of this very odd, eccentric man who, was, who, who we looked down upon in many ways. Uh, he was uh, kind of like your classic uh, Chinaman character. And a, a, he was a source of shame and a source of embarrassment. And this story, in, in this particular story, um, I found a way to honor this man uh, as a man and as a Chinese man. Uh, and then, and, and I probably performed this monologue more than any other piece I have in, in my 30 years. Uh, then you'll see um, an excerpt from a show called What? No Ping Pong Balls, which is basically my mother's life story from birth to death and sort of traces her uh, journey um, through single motherhood, single parenthood through the 60s and 70s when American culture was going through this massive upheaval, the, the civil rights movement, uh, uh, hippie counterculture, the, the, the second wave of, of, of modern feminism. Um, and then uh, the third piece is a, a short piece that was uh, written about three years ago, shortly after my father died and uh, kind of about the, the, the evolution of my relationship with my father. So I told you family is, I've got family on the brain. Um, and then the last snippet you'll see is from a piece that I directed called Tales of Clamor, uh, which is sort of about uh, the Japanese American community's um, 
response to the, the internment camps and the, the community's finding of its voice um, <clears throat> and dealing with silence. Mm. Uh, silence that is externally imposed and silence that is internally imposed. So it's about uh, six minutes worth of stuff. So uh, why don't we go ahead and roll that video and we'll see how it plays back. I finished high school, went to college, art school. Got a degree, got a job, traveled to Asia. Hong Kong, China, and Japan, every year for five years, started to explore the unknown, the forgotten, the ignored, listening to unheard voices of culture, family, and self. And around that time, I finally decided to try and deal with my feelings. And I quit getting stoned. And I remember my grandpa's singing. Now, I remember a man who delighted in the sound of his own spirited voice, completely uninhibited. A man who, though he knew we were laughing at him, allowed himself to sing out loud, said yes to a song, songs that had never been sung before and would never can be repeated. <laughs> I thought, how many could do that very same thing? many of us willing to sing our song, even in the face of ridicule. Because the simple delight of singing is too great to be denied. Because the moment calls for a song, because your life is a song. And what a rich and wise lesson from fun. Come on, Mrs. Huang, push, push, you can do it. Oh, congratulations, Mrs. Huang. It's a healthy baby boy. Mama, just cut the cord. Gestation is complete. Time to use my little feet. Professor! The psychodynamics of your parents' relationship are absolutely riddled with socio-political trauma. Right. The odds of these young people forging a mutually fulfilling relationship were, were tantamount to a snowball's death in hell. Four children in the span of six years in an unfulfilling marriage. Why, you may ask? In a restless world of misses, love is ended before it's begun. In fiber and in memory, Momo records her journey. A single mother with four kids and no money, with visions of being an artist and no illusions of security. Momo is going where few Asian American women of her generation have gone before. I watch other boys walking around with their dads and I wonder, what's a father supposed to feel like? I can't remember.
The Japanese American community did not break its silence about what happened to them until four decades later. The shy, reserved character helped Japanese look good in the eyes of Caucasians because of its lack of aggression. They had to fit into a system that made them conform. Uh-huh. And they all to try to not reserve, restraint, deference, dignity. My name is James Nissel Barone. My name is Jane Nishio. My name is Chad Suji. Well, that didn't play back very well, but you get the general idea. Thank you so much, Dan. You know, I've seen you perform live and your work is always so moving to me. Um, the later pieces seem so, uh, it made me think about this moment in time and, and generations that um, coming to the United States at this moment and what it's like for them. I'm an, daughter of immigrants myself. So I really relate to your work and it's very poetic and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm gonna introduce Mark Zimmerman. He is an American artist, writer, and martial artist. Since 1998, he has exhibited his paintings in 23 solo shows and numerous group exhibitions throughout the United States, Europe, and Australia. As a writer, he has pub widely published poetry and short fiction, as well as essays and critical works on painting, photography, sculpture, architecture, theater, and film throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. So would you share us, with us a little bit about your work while we look at some of the images? Sure. Um, my work, I like to think of it as a, uh, painterly geometry. Um, it's over the last few years, it's gone from a, a metaphoric landscape to more of a, uh, dare I say a lyrical landscape. Um, I also, it's, it's very infused with my interest in ancient history in particular. Um, and what I'm, I'm very uh, passionate about my practice with my notebooks and inevitably that will uh, come into the paintings at some point uh, via process or intent perhaps. Can you say a little bit more about how the notebooks enter the paintings? Uh, it's, it's almost difficult to discuss, but um, I write regularly in my notebooks. And then there are drawings that sort of bleed into the, the writing, if you will. And eventually I will stumble upon a line-based composition that might be of interest to me. And then I will begin to work that into a painting towards its completion. Most of my paintings take about two to three years to make. Uh, so there's a very drawn out process initially. Um, I call that the blue collar work. You know, it's basically showing up and putting the work in. And at a certain point, it's the art process. It's the poetry of actually making a painting. 
And that's when, ironically, somewhat, the drawings actually inform the paintings. Um, it's not an early matter of information. It's later on when things are beginning to come together. Can we see? It? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And this is actually, um, this piece is called, he then traveled to Rhodes to study rhetoric and philosophy. And uh, I was reading the great early American uh, historian, Will Durant, and he was recounting a tale of Julius Caesar. As a young man, he was kidnapped by a band of pirates. And while kidnapped just through his authority of presence, they kept it quiet while he was sleeping. And he read them his poetry, which they made fun of. He didn't like the price of his ransom. He insisted that it was way too low. <laughs> and for that reason, you know, he told them that when he escaped, he would hunt them down. And he did. And I'm not sure how I attached this to this painting, but at a certain point, just thinking about uh, Caesar and his writings and his audacity of character, it just really, that, that one line from Will Durant hit me. It was just so matter of fact. Um, and it just felt very, very right for this particular piece. Um, this piece is called Praetorian Magnus, and it, I think I worked, I think this piece took me about four years. Um, it started off as essentially a white painting, if you will, and then I became just seduced by this metallic gold that I had ordered you know, suddenly showed up in my studio, Nova Color, uh, Southern California. And once the gold took the painting over, it very much became the subject matter. And, you know, again, at the time, just, you know, my readings and the writing I was doing regarding ancient history, uh, the title just kind of landed on this piece I just saw it as, you know, I felt like I was really going for a certain majesty. And I think it came together. You know, I'm actually very, I'm very proud of this piece. Uh, this piece is Xenophon. Uh, Xenophon was a, I believe he was, a, I don't think he was a Spartan, but uh, an early, Greek mercenary and general. And after an unsuccessful bid to overthrow the emperor of Persia, uh, he led his army of 10,000 men all the way through Persia back to Greece. And what really struck me with his story of that retreat was that they came upon Assyrian ruins that they, they didn't even understand how they could have been built. You know, they had come across a ancient civilization that was technologically more advanced than their contemporaneous civilization. And even the locals that they came across had no explanation for the walls or the buildings or the structures. They, they just had no way to, to fathom it. Um, very similar to in the quote unquote dark ages, the Europeans just assumed that the aqueducts were built by giants. You know, it's, uh, so that was, that hit me very hard. And again, just between drawing and writing out my thoughts about what I'm reading, this title seemed to fit with this painting. So again, it's very, it's very integrated. Uh, 
this piece is Legion. This is, uh, I completed it in 2020. Um, and I wanted to get away a little bit from the, the drawing element as the content to a geometric form. And again, through my notebooks, um, this form arrived. And I have it in a couple other larger pieces, one piece that's currently in my studio and one that's in a private collection. Um, and I actually quite enjoy it and I'm gonna be revisiting it for some time, I would imagine. How dimensional is the paint on your paintings? I've not seen them in person, but they seem like they're, you could, they'd have texture and body to them. There's quite a bit, yeah. There's, um, you know, not just the, the length of time that I'm putting the paint on, but I actively go for a certain amount of relief in my paintings. Um, you know, like some of the, the drawing elements are actually taped off and then the paint is troweled on. And then I will follow that line with graphite. Um, actually, the geometric form in this piece is extremely heavy. I would almost say sculptural. Um, so I, you know, I noticed I brought one of my pieces home and hung it up. And it just struck me that I was seeing painting in the round, if you will. And so I wanted to really exploit that. that you know, I, I wanted to investigate it. I wanted to see how far I could push that. Um, still painting, you know, it's still a, an area, a space, but I was very, very interested in seeing how heavy I could go. Not the most articulate statement, but. Um, this piece, um, a more esteemed reputation for his eloquence, um, again, 2020, I wanted to break up the frame, the plane, excuse me. Um, and as I started working in this center, very reliefed area, if you will, uh, I just got pulled in more and more and uh, applying more paint, going back in, excising, putting back in. And it was also, my painting started out with a drawing element and then I go into it with uh, several layers of a very viscous wash and then I sand in to bring the drawing and the color back out. And this was one of the few paintings where that wasn't really the entire process. It was a lot of what I was doing was, uh, was working that central vertical element and trying to establish a relationship with the various blues. But this piece came together for me actually fairly quickly. It took about a little less than a year probably nine months. Yeah. Um. Um, this piece is called In a Callous Time, which we're kind of in a callous time, so <laughs> that worked out. Um, and this was this piece came together through my usual process of laying down a drawing element, going over it, sanding back in, uh, developing the drawing. And it really came together when I painted the entire panel black and then did my best to take the black off with water. Uh, so there was this really nice stain that came through. And once I had gotten to that point, uh, the blues and the composition itself really began to take form. Well, yep. I think I think 
that gives us a really good sense of your work. Um, you know, when I see your work, Mark, I always think of it as like scores of music. That's my association with your, with your work. And I always, always have an incredible sense of um, atmosphere. Like I have a, a distinct sense of the quality of the air where these pieces take me or the temperature of the day or the time of day. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your beautiful work. And now I'm going to introduce Kang Nguyen. He is a visual artist, curator, and PhD candidate in Eastern and Western philosophies at Claremont Graduate University. He studies the non-dual tradition in the East, as well as the dialectical tradition and postmodern philosophy in the West. Nguyen wants to bridge these distinct traditions by showing their commonality, but at the same time, respect their irreducible differences. Welcome. Oh, thank you. All right, so let's uh, share a screen. All right, um, is that visible to, to everyone? All right, uh, let's start with um, this one. So this one was completed in 2019 for so intra-being, dialectic, dialectic of self and other. So uh, my work explored the notion of uh, dualistic perception and was as well as how to access a more holistic awareness of, uh, of being. So um, let me use this pointer here. So uh, down, can anyone see that, that red pointer? Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't, know, I don't know if you can see it in this uh, image, but um, on one side, uh, th there's kind of like a turquoise uh, color and the other side is kind of uh, bluish. So that, that represents uh, dualistic perception, like self and other inside and outside. And to related to the, the theme of this um, event, uh, feminine and masculine. And so, but then in the center here is how access to, I guess, a more uh, heightened level of uh, consciousness is possible. So if we remain down, down here, we're stuck in the, the realm of becoming. But then moving up through the, the center, it opens up to uh, this dimension of uh, being and, and knowing. So up here, there's, there's no... Um, duality or division into subject and object. So the knower is identical to the known. So it's just a different mode of, uh, of knowing. Let's go to, uh, this one's called Summit of, Summit of Limpid Seeing, completed this year. And it explores the, the same concept. So uh, dualistic perception is down here. You see the contrast between the, the green and purple. So that's um, dualistic perception, perception of subject and object. And these panels here, they re represent moments of time, moments of um, becoming. And then through inward introspection, you can move up this uh, structure here to, I guess, uh, this level of awareness. And then it unfurls into um, this realm. So up here, Again, there's no, no duality between observer and what is observed. So the, the knower is identical to what is known. And this one is the most recent one. It's called uh, Leaping Through Moments of Becoming. Um, let's see, so down here is my representation of uh, dualistic perception subject object um, structure of knowing. And then here is the, down here is the primordial field of consciousness from which this structure arises. And again, these um, shapes that they represent moments of time, pre present, past and future. And then in the center here, through a process of uh, turning inward, um, I guess you can call it meditation or um, contemplation, there's this um, 
upward movement. So it's, it's a, a leap. It's not a sequential development. It's not, um, it's not linear development. It's a, a sudden shift or a, a sudden transition into another mode of, of knowing. So up here, uh, it's hard to see it in this image, but it's, it's a, the same concept again, where the, the knower and, and known are identical, or um, there's no distinction between knower and known. And then from uh, this realm, there's another opening up to this realm of, uh, of being. And this part right here also shows the uh, identity of knower and known. And from up here, it encompasses this uh, entire structure here. But if we remain in dualistic perception, all we see um, is uh, division, difference, dis distinction. And that's where uh, conflict and violence in society um, comes from, if we remain at that level of uh, perception. And uh, this one is called uh, Unfolding Facets of uh, Comprehensive Knowing. So uh, down here is um, judicial perception, moments of time, and the field from which um, that structure emerges. And then again, the, the leaping that unfurls in the, into this um, non-dual structure. So down here, it's a fragmented uh, mode of knowing. And up here, the, the unfolding, that's the more comprehensive um, knowing. And this one, this is uh, finished in 2019. It's called Trans Spatial Temporal Manifestation of Being. So again, uh, these uh, panels, they represent moment, moments of time, present, past, and future, dualistic perception. Uh, the field from, from which it arises. And then the part um, where it says trans spatial temporal uh, manifestation. So that's a uh, leaping beyond space and time. So this uh, central part right here shows that, that leaping or that transcending movement. And so it unfurls into this uh, structure of knowing and being. So up here, as you can see, there's no duality between perceiver and perceived, and it also shows that here. There's no distinction between known and, um, between knower and what is known. And my last piece, uh, it's called Unreified Interweaving, finished uh, this year. Uh, this one, I kind of reversed the, the, the field. So the field, instead of being uh, below, it, it's now um, up here. So up here, as you can see, there's no uh, distinction or contrast between known and known. And then there's a, a process of uh, descending. So it descends into uh, dualistic perception. Again, the difference between perceiver and what is perceived. And in this uh, realm down here, that, that's where um, the tensions and, and I guess um, oppositional forms of, um, of conflict uh, arise. It's down here, the dualistic um, realm of perception. All right, any um, questions, comments? I, th I feel like I could sit and meditate in front of your work for hours. It, it definitely calls for that. Um, and I definitely feel that sensation of that if I could sit and be with these paintings, I would get the knowledge that you're talking about just by being with the paintings. Um, would you, I just do have one question for you. What came first in terms of your studies and your paintings? like? Or the, your, your study of philosophy, um, was it pre, does it precede the paintings? Do the paintings precede the studies? Um, I, I wouldn't uh, say that it's a, a linear development. I, I would say they simultaneously um, complement. Um, but with, with my study of uh, philosophy, it's, it's more of a, 
conceptual form of, of understanding. And uh, with art, it's, it's a, a different mode of um, knowing and seeing. It's, it's a, more of a, a visual language. Mm -hmm. So with, with my, my paintings, I can see it from a, a visual perspective. And with philosophy, it's more conceptual, theoretical, rational uh, perspective. And I understand that you also do curation. How does that factor into your, the full aspect of who you are and your work? Well, I, the ideas from my curatorial, curatorial projects are drawn from uh, philosophical ideas. Um, let's see, the most recent show that I curated is called Phenomenology of Hope. So, so that's the philosophical investigation of the concept of hope from a phenomenological, I guess, approach. Phenomenology is a discipline or a school within uh, philosophy. And then I have another one that's going to open in um, October. It's called the Five Facets of uh, Humanity. And that one ex explores um, human nature and that, the ideals that we um, strive for. And where do we see those ex exhibitions? Um, for Phenomenology of Hope, uh, it's it's just uh, phenomenologyofhope.com. Uh, it's it's a um, th there are two galleries. There's a virtual reality gallery where you can uh, walk into the the gallery, and you can invite friends to uh, to join you, and then you can have a conversation with them inside the, the virtual gallery. So it's more uh, interactive and, and social. And the five facets of humanity uh, dot com. Um, there's going to be a virtual gallery, and then um, there's going to be a physical show at Fellows of Contemporary Art in, in LA. So it's a hybrid, you know, an actual show and also a, a virtual one. It's a brilliant response to the moment that we're in. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to begin our dialogue. Um, with the very first question that we pose to you guys, which is, how do you define manhood? Is that question for? All three of you. Anybody who wants to jump in would be great. Okay, I guess I, I can start since, <laughs> or uh, uh, Dan, would you like to start? Oh, go ahead, Tom, go ahead. Uh, how I define manhood. So um, I think this concept of gender, um, there's nothing uh, inherent or fixed in it. And it's uh, shaped by our culture and, and the times um, we're situated in. So um, I don't think uh, gender or masculinity should be or can be fully defined because it's more of an ongoing process of development and change. So by fully defining it, it would kind of reinforce general um, rigidity. I, I would prefer to, to be open and, uh, and fluid. Oh, and uh, one last thing. Um, I also think uh, for true gender equality to be possible, um, personality traits and roles in society should be, or needs to be, degendered. So in a degendered world, men and women, gay, bi, straight, and trans would then be free to display traits and behaviors um, that have been associated with, uh, with just one gender. So from, from that, I believe uh, some form of gender equality uh, would be possible. That's a true reinvention of the term gender. <laughs> oh, I could, I could follow on that. I, I think I have a very similar perspective to what Kong just described. Um, and I think of manhood as um, a process. Uh, and and uh, I mean, you know, you can, you can define manhood from just sort of the, the physiological, biological perspective, you know, but I don't think that's what we're talking about here. And um, when I think of manhood, 
Uh, I'm very conscious of, you know, everything that I was taught and trained and conditioned with, you know, from the, uh, from the time that I was born and raised. Um, and how those things still affect me, uh, even though I disagree with uh, a great deal of it. It still is in my head, you know, all the things that I was taught about this is what manhood is. Uh, so so I, I find it is kind of this ongoing process of me sorting out, you know, everything that I was raised with versus what I actually think. So, um, oh, one example I was talking to my friend this morning about was how um, uh, I remember going out to brunch with a with a girlfriend many many years ago, and we 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 each ordered the identical meal and he had had the identical drink, and when the bill came, we were going to split it, but I felt really compelled, like I should pay more than half because I was the guy. And later realizing, wait a minute, she makes way more money than I do. Why did I do that? You know, that, and just sort of seeing how these things that I have been programmed with about, this is what you do if you're a man. You know, that that's, this is the man's role. The man's role is to, to lessen the load for the woman. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's, there's a thousands of these kinds of examples and women have their whole set that they've been, you know, loaded with. And so I'm constantly having to sort through, you know, everything that I was told about this is what it means to be a man versus what I actually believe in and what I actually think, and what actually makes sense to me. Um, and Would you I'm, say something about what does make sense to you? Well, I think it, it t touches back on, on kind of what Kong was saying that, uh, you know, I think um, men and women are 99.99% the same as human creatures on this planet. And um, with the great varieties that we have, I, I think our human essence is, is, is very, very much the same. Um, we, we, all, we all have minds. We all uh, love, we all f experience fear, we all, you know, uh, have pain, uh, we all have courage, we all have strength, you know. Um, so uh, that, that, that's sort of my perspective on it is that a lot of it is a, a sorting out process that I'm going through. Mark? Am I off beat? Yep. Um, I mean, for me, when I looked at the question, I just thought about um, attributes, basically, uh, that I would look for in a friend. Uh, and, you know, first of all, I would come up with strength, honor, kindness, competency, perseverance, and courage. Um, I, and actually, uh, this afternoon, my wife pointed out that those are the same characteristics that we should look for in a woman as well. So, uh, there's that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, m my idea of manhood is perhaps a little more traditional. Um, growing up in a military family, you know, I, I, uh, being a child in Hawaii, it's, it's hard to get away from that. Um, but, you know, when I think of the men who are important to me in my life, these are the characteristics that they put forth. So to me, I, I think that's a important part. I wonder how the three of you, if you want to respond to what each of you said in terms of what your definition of manhood is, if it's, you know, sparked any thoughts or if you have any questions or reactions to what any of you have said. 
Well, well I think you made a good point um, about, I get, I, I, I'm sorry if, was it degendering? Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've been a full-time parent for nine years. Full-time parent, full-time artist, full-time martial artist. And it's hard. You know, I've changed more diapers than probably almost any man on the planet right now. Um, and I did that with relish. You know, I, it, so I totally get that where he was. I, I, I completely agree with him in that regard. Uh, but I also just think that there's, there are, let's just say stereotypical male attributes that are extremely important not to lose. Because if we lose those, we lose a lot. Um, so in my, you know, my journey as a parent has been to take on another, another mode of living, another, another, uh, skill set. So, but yeah, I, that resonated with me. Mark, I'm curious, what, what are some of the attributes that you think we don't, we should not lose? I'm, you broke up there, Con, I lo or Dan, I'm sorry, I lost you a little bit. What are some of those attributes that you think is important that we not lose? Well, you know, I think, you know, again, strength, competency. Um, you know, I can put up a wall, and, but I'm not real good at it. It'll take me a lot longer than a skilled carpenter, but I can do it. Um, you know, I'm in the weight room. Well, not now, but <laughs> I was. Um, you know, I think there are, there are masculine elements that should be cultivated. And I, I think that's important. And again, particularly as a martial artist, I'm coming at it from a, a very uh, biased bent in that regard. But, you know, I think men should function in that capacity of strength. You know, I think it's important. Uh, you know, I want, you know, the friends that I have, the men that I am close with, they are all, if not physically strong in terms of barbell strength, they are mentally strong. They are philosophically strong. And I think that's important. And again, as I said, you know, my wife pointed out that these are characteristics that a woman should have. And I'm, you know, when she said that, I was like, oh, yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> um, yeah. But I, 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 having worked a lot with children in my adult life, I've seen certain young men go in a way towards what I view as a very positive masculine uh, context, if you will. Strength, honor, kindness, competency, perseverance, courage. And I've seen other men go another way. And it doesn't work out real well. So, but, you know, I think defining, defining masculinity or femininity is sort of a minefield but you know since we're having this talk you know that's there i am and that's exactly what we're trying to do is have those conversations that really don't get discussed and the, the subtleties are so important you know i think that um you know when you were talking about those qualities i certainly identify with all of them um, and I, I know you want your daughter to be competent and courageous and strong. And sure. so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think one of the things that when Snijana and I were putting this together, we were looking at some of the more right wing ideas of what a man is in this environment that we live in today. And, um, and kind of the, 
empowering of a toxic side of masculinity. Um, and I thought, you know, it's, it's an interesting conversation to have, especially the parts that are hard to have. Sure. Um, I grew up, uh, so I'm, I'm born in the mid fifties. And so um, I grew up with a pretty typical, uh, Mark, I'm gonna guess you and I are in ballpark same, same age range or am I older than you? You were born in the fifties? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, you got me beat by a little bit. Yeah, I was born in 67. Okay, I'll, okay, I get to beat by a lot. So anyways, I grew up with a pretty <laughs> traditional male roles, right? Um, but here was the funny twist. I grew up with three sisters, and after my parents' divorce, I was living in a household with four females. And so what I came to see was like, geez, my models of, of females were, they were smarter than me. They were tough. They were capable. They had integrity. They had courage. Um, so I did not grow up at all with the concept of women in any way less than me. That was my lived experience. But, but at the same time, I did get all the socialization that I am superior to women because I'm a guy. Um, and, and so I, th these conflicting things were, were part of my, in my, um, perspective on, on gender, on, on, on sex. Um, and so I always saw, I always thought of females as totally capable people. My sisters, whenever my sisters would be in relationships with guys, they were always smarter than the guys. They were always more capable than the guys. It was kind of a running joke in the family, you know. Nobody could keep up with them. So, um, and when I was in the fourth grade, I could knit, I could sew, I could bake. I could do all these things that no other kids, another guy, I would bring my knitting to school. Like, hey man, look at this, look, look at this. I thought it was cool. And, and at the same time, a very typical boy, you know, had lots of violence in my, in my childhood as a boy. I fought, you know, I was a tough kid. Um, but I guess what this kind of led me to do was to be open to questioning these models, these models of what is, what is male, what the term, even the terms masculine and feminine to me are taking this full spectrum of human qualities. So some of the things that Mark mentioned, um, uh, strength and, and competence and, and courage. It's taking this, this spectrum of human qualities and divvying them up and say, okay, guys, you get those and women, you get those. And so I think we hear a lot these days that men need to reclaim their femininity and women need to reclaim their masculinity but that's not how I think of it. I think of it as we need to reclaim our humanity. That, that to me, it's fully female to be strong. It's fully female to be brave and confident. And it's fully male to be gentle and graceful and tender. And that these are things that, that, that we all have as human beings, but we've been told these are the ones you get. And you stay away from those and vice versa. So, I, I mean, I've got dozens of examples of this, how I have to battle this in my own mind. Um, I was in a cab with my daughter two years ago, uh, and she told me she was going to break some kid's arm, a boy, you know. So, yes, I, you know, 100%. I'm, I'm in a, my mother was an incredibly I mean, it still is, thank God, uh, incredibly powerful influence on my life. I met my wife at a karate dojo, you know, fighting her. Um, you know, my daughter's, you know, my daughter would, 
<laughs> you know, I was doing deadlifts with my daughter the other day. I, I think that, you know, what I was discussing is just, uh, you know, I think I took the, I took the question to heart, if you will, you know, and, and it's not a, I mean, I a hundred percent agree with you is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But again, you know, in terms of a definition of manhood, and I think about the men that are important to me in my life, my father, my friends, this is what I see. You know, this is what I see in them. This is the example that, you know, my father set for me. Yeah, yeah. I think that leads us to the next question. In what ways do you challenge the traditional image of men, specifically in the arts? You can answer one or both. Kong, you want to speak to that? Um, sure. So um, how do I challenge the traditional image of uh, men in the arts? Um, so for me, um, let's see, I don't follow what society conventionally um, considers as uh, old masters or, you know, great artists. Um, I question the, the, the rules of greatness. So which leads me to consider issues of gender, race, class, and uh, geography, among others. So the, the uh, ideas and sources for my work are not drawn from the traditional canon of uh, art history. So I discover, you know, overlooked sources uh, such as um, uh, under-recognized uh, female artists, you know, uh, artists um, who are, um, are uh, artists uh, of, of, of people of, of color and uh, ideas from, from other cultures. So, so I challenge that by, again, um, challenging the uh, traditional canon of uh, art history. Want to go, Mark, or? Sure. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't challenge uh, <laughs> traditional masculinity in the arts, to be honest. Um, I cry at movies. Um, I, I try to be the best artist I can. I try to be the best father I can. I try to be the best husband I can. And I think that if masculin masculinity is done well, you know, we're all good. Um, you know, I th think I'm not really a fan of identitarian philosophies. I think they're somewhat intellectually incoherent. Um, but, you know, as a, a father and an artist, I think the biggest thing for me was coming to terms with parenthood and how it conflicted with my studio practice. And I sorted that out and I prioritized what was most important. So again, yeah, I'm, I, I don't think I'm challenging anything really, but I am coming to terms with uh, issues that are not perhaps traditionally masculine. If that, again, probably very art inarticulate, but. Um, how did you sort that out, Mark? And how did you sort that out and wind up prioritizing those things? How did that happen? Well, it was, it was uh, very difficult, but it just became, it, yeah, I mean, my daughter is more important than my time in the studio. That that was that was it. No, <laughs> you know, there, there's nothing. There's nothing beyond that. And I also, you know, I've I've spoken before with the Key Pai Pai fellows. I read a great essay by Hemingway, where he was detailing his his writing practice. You know, he got up. I think he got up at like six in the morning and wrote. But he specifically mentioned that he stopped 
when things were going really good because that way the next morning there was no warm up. He could just go right back into it. And I applied that the first day I was back in the studio three weeks after my daughter was born. And it, I just found that it worked and it worked beautifully. And I've just held with that. And, you know, I have my beautiful wife, very supportive. When I have to be in the studio, I'm in the studio. But if, you know, if I, if I'm with my daughter, I'm with my daughter. But when I get to the studio, I'm not warming up. I'm not playing guitar. I'm not cleaning up. I'm painting. I am physically putting paint on canvas. And it's really worked out for me. And I actually think that it's made me a better artist. Well, prioritizing your daughter like that sounds like that's a very uh, profound challenge to the traditional Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> it is. I think it is. Yeah. You know, and, and the, 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 the traditional image is, I think Mark kind of spoke to this also, is it's, it's a mixture. There are some very wonderful, beautiful things in a traditional male image, you know, to have integrity, to have courage. Um, there's some really wonderful things in that traditional image, and there's some completely oppressive screwed up things in there too and um it's interesting that you mentioned that kong because or dan sorry because you know i feel like we're carrying the burden of a historical masculinity yes absolutely and i just i just personally i don't see it applying to right now in What's September 2020. Why not? I, or or what, 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 is, what is not applied? I, I, I just feel that, again, you know, it's this overarching theme of men, but I just feel that men are kinder. I feel, you know, I feel like we're stepping up to those six characteristics that I mentioned initially. I think we're doing a better job of that now than we were in the 1930s, for instance. Mm. Um, sort of like, you know, the, the image of corporations is greed and just, you know, taking money. And, uh, but there's all these young entrepreneurs who are giving back. I just think that things are a little different. Things are a little kinder. I hope so. And I could be wrong, but that's, that's my feeling. To me, it feels like the positive and the negative are both ramping up. Well, that's what it, I think what you said, I agree with what you said. And I think the negative shit is rising pretty fierce at the same time, you know, and, and it's like, which one is going to come out on top? Um, for for me, the, this question of uh, the traditional image of men, um, I'd say there's in my work. Okay, I'm a storyteller, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll tell stories that are about um, growing up, being a boy, about boy boyhood, boy identity, about the the models of manhood that I had in my childhood, and I, I think there there is a there's a specific way that males are dehumanized in society. And, and one, of, one of the most destructive parts of that is that as males, you are trained very early on that you have, there's two great taboos as a boy. You're not supposed to be scared and you're not supposed to hurt. Every boy grows up, these are the big taboos. You must not, you must not show this and ideally don't even feel it. Okay, and, and what this requires is that boys, as they grow up, need to learn how to numb out. We, need to, we have to learn how to cut off that part of our being. And this is so destructive to us. And so 
and this is in my artwork, um, the, I will tell a story, and when I tell that story, I make it emotional. And so the, the idea that it is an honorable thing for a man to feel his feelings um, and that this is, a, this is part of us as men uh, reclaiming our full humanity. So whether you cry at a movie theater or cry at a beautiful piece of music, um, to me is, um, it, it, that's profoundly liberating. It, it's taking back, it's us as guys taking back our humanity. And so um, I, I tell stories that are, that are about that and, and stories that show that, you know. Um, how do we do that? How do, how, do we, how, do we, how do we melt our hearts? How do we, you know, um, reconnect with, with, with that part of ourselves? Uh, very, that's something I feel very passionately about. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> I want to. I want to throw a kind of a curveball question to you. I'm. I'm. I'm stepping into a little touchy waters, but I'm. I would like you guys to speak to the subject of being men and having a career. And is it easier? Do you think it's easier as a man to have a career and to make work? Do you think there's no difference? Do you think that in this moment it's easier for women to be have a career? Where do you where do you see yourselves in the art world? I think it is. I don't think any gender has an elevated level in terms of career in the art world. Historically, yes, I will grant it. But these days, women rule the art world. You know, if I again, I was sitting with Diane and I was talking about it. And if I just take 10 people that had the most impactful influence on my professional career, probably eight out of 10 of them would be women. Um, you look at Ruth Bachoffner, Andy Campanoni, um, very obviously, um, Sarah Hall in Atlanta, my dealer in New York, Deanne Shashua, you know, they're making moves in the art world that are beautiful. You know, they're, they're showcasing artists. And, you know, I also think that, you know, it, it brings to mind in the 90s when I was a young man and I would be sitting in a bar with older male artists and they're complaining about the galleries and the system and this and that. It's just, it's so unseemly. And I kind of think that's, that's what this is. It's, you know, women are making amazing art and the amazing women artists that I know have never once to me complained about their career. You know, I'm just not hearing women complaining about it. Uh, so I think that we're in a place where things are actually pretty equitable, you know, between the genders. Carl, what's your perspective? Um, well, I, I think that there is more equality um, in the field of art, but I think um, I, I read some, some articles recently and, and uh, they said that, that there's still um, much um, in inequality in, in the art world in terms of uh, represented artists, um, um, I guess um, the amount of uh, recognition, all that are still um, significant, significantly um, towards, towards uh, male artists. So, yeah, like I said, it's the, the, there's more equality, but still, it's, it's still more in favor in favor of uh, male artists. It, we still have a lot of uh, of um, 
there's still a lot of room to to grow and improve in, uh, in that area. What has your personal experience been navigating the art world? Um, can you be more? <laughs> I don't know, it's, well, you're you're doing something. It's kind of interesting because you're doing these curatorial projects. Mm -hmm. You're making work. You're um, it's like you're creating opportunities for yourself and for others. Mm -hmm. um, have you approached the gallery system? Are you interested in exhibiting in galleries? Um, well, I've um, had some conversations with uh, Rosamond Felsen. Um, Yeah, I, I approach a, a few uh, dealers, but um, it's, it's just a very, um, still very competitive, uh, I guess. But you're I, know, I, I haven't really get, uh, gave much thought to this, so um, I'm not sure how to respond. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just think... Um, it's just, I, I'm curious to hear you, your, all of your responses to the, how you've been welcomed or not welcomed into the art world. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, go ahead, Kung. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm kind of in a different genre from Kong and Mark as visual artists, that my work in the performance art field it doesn't have the same, it doesn't kind of have the same operating system like representation. Well, you do have it, but galleries, et cetera. So I don't really have that same kind of experience of, of um, uh, that, that exists in the visual art world. Um, you know, I, it's no secret the, the, the historical sexism in, in the art world, <laughs> you know, in terms of representation, who gets shown at the Whitney and who's, you know, who's in the history books and, um, and then, you know, many, many, um, maybe this is in contrast to Mark, I've had many female artists tell me about uh, uh, their uh, difficulties breaking in to that system. Um, in the performance art world, I don't know that I have experienced gender specific bias uh, in, in my field. Uh, you know, but then here's the thing, uh, uh, and this is the way that, that oppression works and this is the way that sexism works, that as guys, we're not gonna notice it. You, you tend to not notice a bias system that favors you. It just feels normal, right? Um, and, and, and so I, I, I allow that there, there are things that I may not be perceiving. Well, Dan, I, you also come into the, you know, performance art, we'll set aside the whole Japanese beginnings of performance, but the big, the real upsurge of performance art began with the feminist art movement. Yes. And yes. so in your field, it, it was dominated by women. <laughs> yes, in the 70s. And, and the, the women brought in the whole narrative uh, uh, component to performance art. That prior to that, it, it tended to be more kind of, um, you know, ritualistic and, and very abstract. And I think that's something that performance art owes to the great body of work created by women starting in the 70s is this, this idea that, oh, um, telling a story or, your, or sharing your life experience as a, as a subject matter, um, I, I owe a great debt to, that, to women artists for that. Any other thoughts on those questions or do you wanna hear the questions from our viewers. Let's go to our viewers. We have viewers? We do. Why not? Sunajana, do you wanna? Okay, I'm here. Um, okay, so we have um, one 
that is specific to Kang. Um, it says, in view of five facets of humanity that Kang had mentioned, what do you see as the facet that we are facing currently? Or is there such a... Uh, me personally, um, Dan Daising? Yeah. Uh, let's see, so, so there's uh, the meta-human. Well, I don't know if, if I should really get into it since, since uh, Dan Sharon and Mark are not familiar with the five facets. Uh, so it's um, um, metaphysics, and then there's the, the intra-human, and there's the, uh, let me bring it up. Transhuman. Transhuman. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know that, that you, you memorize it better than, than I have. Uh, I guess that right now, personally, I'm, I'm uh, more related to the, the meta-human facet, the, the metaphysical aspect since uh, I'm studying philosophy and spirituality and uh, my artwork deals with that subject matter. So what, what's the... Um... I think the question is like, as if these are superheroes, I, I guess. So is there a facet out of this group that is dominant right now? Yeah, my, my work relates most, most to the metaphysical aspect of, of that um, concept. So again, it's, it's uh, access, accessing, um, I guess, a, uh, you know, the mode of being and, and knowing. That's not limited to uh, dualistic perception. Thank you. And then there are two questions that are for all three of the artists. Um, so one, I guess, was triggered with just mentioning art history and training, uh, the question, is it possible to recognize artist gender by just looking at the artwork? Any thoughts on it? For all three of you guys. Sometimes, you know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would just relate an anecdote from the early part of the century. I went to, a, to uh, the Elizabeth Harris Gallery, and I think it was 2001, and I, there were these amazing paintings, and I had never heard of the artist. The artist's name is Pat Lipsky. Please Google her. She's probably our greatest living painter. Um, What's her name again? Uh, Pat Lipsky, L-I-P-S-K-Y. And I... <laughs> I immediately called my friend, I think I didn't even have a cell phone then, but I called my friend, the critic Larry Qualls, and I was like, I saw these amazing paintings by this guy, Pat Lipsky. <laughs> and he, he says, well, she's a woman. Would you like to get in touch with her? And um, I did. And, uh, you know, we met, had dinner, became friends. Um, yeah, I have no idea where I was going with that, but, <laughs> you know, but, but it's, I, I just think the, the paintings were so rugged and they were so material that, and it's sort it's very similar. It's, ex, it's the exact same experience I had with Carson McCullers, the writer, uh, Southern Gothic writer. I read her work having no idea that she was a woman. And, you know, I guess it's a negative on me, but because it was so raw and so tough, I just was, I just assumed Carson McCullers was a man. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, but other than that. Anybody else wants to respond? Dan was like, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess uh, in resp responding to what Mark says, I mean, we, we, we have uh, uh, biases in, in our perceptions. You know, we have, uh, we, we've been, we've been all trained to think of, 
well, you know, these qualities equal this gender. And, and you know, Mark's stories are wonderful examples of how that um, is not necessarily so, right? I mean, you, you're confounded by this. Oh, I was sure that was a, a man, or I'm sure that was a woman. And, and, and we find out that, that I mean, that, that says, that teaches us something about ourselves. It teaches us about our perceptions and how our perceptions are skewed. It's just that I was walking away from it. It was like, oh, you yeah. know, hey. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree with Dan. It's a fact that we, when we live in a bias, we are not able to recognize it because that's the state of mind and perception that we live in. And also... I think, Shazana, though, that, you know, it could be said, knowing your work as I do, that your work is very feminine. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I have to say to that, could you explain why? Because I was trained exclusively by white men. But you're not that. I, I just think that, you know, I mean, you and I have had a fair amount of time together, not as much as I would wish, but there is a sinuous, you know, the color, the care, it, it, dare I say it's almost paternal or maternal, excuse me. Um, so, I mean, I, I think this is, this is a question that we could do like a whole podcast on this question. Um, but I just think that, you know, when I look at your art, it is, it does speak as feminine to me, you know, particularly, you know, some of the more painterly applications that you and I have discussed, you know, I, I see that as, I see the feminine in that, in a very positive way, for sure. Um, in the world of polarities or duality, where there is distinct male and female kind of vocabulary, I'd say. Um, I, I'm curious, and I, I would love to talk more about that uh, with you um, in future, because, um, yeah, I'm, I'm of a kind of opinion that Khan has that um, gender less world is the future, or that's what we are arriving, the, the fluidity of gender is uh, not clear anymore um, or so precise as it used to be. Uh, the uh, bell hooks talks a lot about uh, how men are not allowed to cry and all these like, changes that are happening uh, in the generation that is actually starting with you because the um, boomers were facing this um, strange um, context in which uh, women were feminists and, you know, like in 60s and fighting for the uh, women's rights. And then men are growing like as boys with these mothers that are feminists, but not having really strongly defined roles. And uh, as a new emerging uh, man. And so it's kind of interesting, the hotomy that is happening um, in the world, uh, in our world, in art as well, in, in uh, trying to redefine who we are and understand what is our role. And so um, I'm just really curious. Uh, uh, Mark, do you speak uh, other languages? <laughs> I mean, at various times I've been a little okay with some languages, but yeah, I wouldn't say I speak anything else. But uh, but you grew up in Germany, no? You were just born. I, I was born in Germany. How yeah, about Dan and Klang? Uh, do you guys speak other languages? Well, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Klang okay. and Dan, guys, uh, if, are you speaking I, other languages? Uh, in my, my program, I have to be proficient in like four or five uh, foreign languages. But oh. it's only for uh, comprehension and translation, not for uh, uh, conversation. So I'm um, proficient in German, French, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, Sanskrit, and I need to pick up Japanese. But my proficiency is only for comprehension and uh, translation mm -hmm. and not for speaking. 
Uh, how about you, Dan? Pretty impressive. Um, I can sort of hack my way through a conversation in Japanese. Um, I've studied many languages, but Japanese is really the only semi-functional second language that I have. The reason why I'm asking, I was wondering how um, much of the language uh, is influencing and defining who we are and our understanding of our identity mm. as well as cultural background. So, um, and you know, how, how much of that actually uh, is really creating this understanding of the gender roles and fluidity. Because oh, for me, more culture than the language, I would say. Like, culture certainly has influenced my, the shaping of my it, male persona. Definitely the culture. But I just have like one example. In my language, there is a middle um, gender, which applies exclusively to ch children hmm. before they reach the puberty. Hmm. And so you, you're growing up with this, uh, yes, you have he and she, but you're growing up with this um, sense that there is it that's in between the genders, kind of gender. So I was just wondering if that's maybe uh, that's interesting, yeah. the case with you know other languages, but that's also cultural, as you said. Yeah. yeah. So I, I kind of got the hardcore American version. <laughs> Boys? And on that topic, cool. Right. The uh, last question was actually to all of you guys. Uh, do, do you see that your uh, art practice right now is affected with, um, and how is it, if it is, uh, with the current pandemic and the political uh, climate? So if you can, we have like a couple more minutes, if you guys can each answer in conclusion would be great. So who wants to start again? Well, uh, there ain't no live theater happening right now, hardly, right? So uh, my, a lot of my uh, work is turning into Zoom projects, you know, uh, Zoom readings, Zoom performances, Zoom gatherings, Zoom events. Um, so that is a, a major change. And, and um, on the other hand, as a writer, not much changes at all. You're sitting there in your studio with your computer. There's no difference at all. Um, but in terms of how you share your work with people, holy cow, it's like, how, how the hell are we going to do this? You know, um, and, and it's um, several projects I have. They're like totally thrown up in the air. Like, how are we going to do this? You know, okay, we resign ourselves to an online event. So. Thank you so much, then. Kang, how about you? Uh, well, I, I try not to let the uh, pandemic uh, affect my work. Uh, my, I practice uh, yoga, and it, it helps to uh, keep my uh, creative energy flowing. And um, I, I try to get into a, a certain uh, mindset where, where uh, emotions don't play... Um, don't play a, a major role in terms of uh, uh, motivation. So I, I, I need to paint to, to create regardless of, of how I feel. You know, if, if, I, if, if I wait to feel good, then I, I would never, you know, get anything done. So, so it's, it's trying to realize that, that clarity that's not, that's not dependent on emotional states or uh, external circumstances. Did, did you reach sadhana? <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. But uh, thank you so very much. And uh, the, the, the last but not the least, Mark, uh, you're also a poet and martial artist and philosopher and painter and all these roles. So how does, do you see the, the current situation, political as well as pandemic? is affecting your work? Well, you know, I mean, I, I don't think politically my work has been affected in any way. Uh, in terms of the pandemic, you know, we left the city. We've been living at my in-laws 
place. Uh, we're in a very rural area of New York. And so, uh, you know, we've been hiking, I've been fishing a lot. Uh, and I noticed that green is coming into my paintings quite a bit. Uh-huh. <laughs> and again, it's, it's, I only get to my studio in Brooklyn maybe once a week, but I've been writing again much more. And um, you know, I've I've told my wife that I keep trying to look for positives in all of this. And I think that creatively there are positives for artists somehow. Um, I know that I feel some positives. Again, simply creatively. You know, everybody's everybody's going through this horrifying experience. But, um, you know, if there's something that you can take from it that is positive, I think that's a good thing. And that's what I've been trying to do. And for me, it's for me, it's working. This is fantastic to, to finish off on the positive note and hope to, that we all can get to the place like hung and be unaffected like Dan doing the work with the transitioning to new medias. Um, I really want to thank everybody, Sharon, for running all of this and, and uh, holding the, the water because this is the first panel that we're doing, so it's kind of hard. Sharon, you want to say something too before we finish? I'm just really so grateful to everybody. Thank you guys. Sharon? This took, a, this took more than just, you know, all of us sitting here took a, a little army to make this all work. And I appreciate everybody's participation and contributions. I also want to say that if anybody uh, missed the early part of the discussion, that it's all going to be on our website where you can find links to YouTube and uh, watch the whole thing from the beginning. Thank you guys so much for being here. I know this was um, at moments challenging conversation and um, I really appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Pleasure.